So welcome uh, class and we are going to discuss uh, this paper or oh, that was done in August 2023 and it's an introduction to law and governance paper uh, that takes basically three hours and we have a total of uh, how many questions? Seven questions. So we're going to look at each of the questions and we'll start with question one of this August 2023 paper. So, number one, question one A, with reference to sale of goods act, with reference to sale of goods act, explain the term symbolic delivery, and marks allocated is two marks, explain the term symbolic delivery. I'll start by giving you an example, I think example will uh, take the point home, uh, where somebody gives you a uh, car keys. What does uh, car keys mean? Possibly there is a car somewhere. So car keys becomes a uh, symbol for the car. Or somebody gives you warehouse keys. It's basically uh, not to mean that he's, give, he's handing over the warehouse to you. It's very common even in uh, contracts where you're supposed to construct a house. So when the house is ready, you simply give the car keys the, the 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 house keys to the owner of the house and that is what we mean by symbolic delivery so it's a, just a simple thing instead of handing over the main item you hand over the means to the main item how the entry to the main item something like that so i think um for our notes we can just say that um uh this is uh, where you hand over where you hand over the means the means to the property the means to gain entry to the property and not the property itself and not the property the property not the property itself itself so the means to gain entry to the property and not or the means of uh, obtaining the means to obtain possession to obtain possession of the goods delivered of the goods sorry delivered of the goods delivered uh, and not the good themselves not the goods themselves so we give you the means to gain possession to the goods uh, that we tend to deliver so Having given you the means, it simply means that you can go ahead and access the goods in question. Very common with houses, uh, construction companies and houses, and also the, 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 the you know, these showrooms, the, the car dealers, they just hand over the key to show that, uh, you know, you can go ahead and possess now the main item in question, which is now the car. That is what we call symbolic delivery. Then, uh, Number two, question A2, state three options available to a buyer when the seller delivers goods of a larger quantity than ordered. State three options available to a buyer when the seller delivers goods of a larger quantity than ordered. So the three options, number one, you can either accept what you ordered for, accept what you ordered for, accept what you ordered for, and uh, what this means is that you reject the rest reject the rest simply because we've been told that uh, the goods have been delivered uh, in larger quantities in excess of what you had ordered so just accept what you had ordered and reject the excess that is the first option the second option is to reject the whole lot reject the whole lot for the simple reason that it doesn't meet your 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 your, your request requisition orders, so you can reject the whole lot. It is possible so that you can go uh, you can um, redo the order again and uh, simply send what you have requested for. So you can reject the whole lot, and number three, you can also accept accept the whole lot. But if you accept the whole lot, remember it's in excess of what you had ordered. So you can accept the whole 
of the goods that have been uh, delivered but that means you have to pay for all of them at the contract rate accept the whole and pay for all of the goods accepted at the contract rate at the contract uh, rate so that is uh, what we Oh, wait, wait, wait. Those are the three options that we have what you can do in case the seller delivers goods of a larger quantity than ordered. Either accept what you had ordered, reject the rest, or reject the whole lot. Or you can also accept the whole lot and go ahead and pay for the whole lot at that rate that you had agreed. Then highlight seven characteristics of a good law. Highlight seven characteristics of a good law. Good law. How should a good law be? The seven characteristics of a good law. Now, number one, good law should be basically uh, for the interest of the people. Interest of the people. It should be for the interest of the people. So it is people who uh, should uh determine the laws of the land it should not be determined by a few selected few but it should be determined by the people and we talk of things like referendums and the group so it should be in the interest of the people and for the people then uh, good law must not discriminate must not discriminate it must shun away from discrimination so must not discriminate and then must be reasonable must be reasonable which means it should resonate with so many people there are some uh, items possibly that maybe are not when you say that they are not reasonable it means that they don't just go with so many people they don't make sense at the very end you know so must be reasonable meaning that most of the majority of the people should be able to agree and see sense in that particular uh, piece of uh, law and then uh, of course we can we can also say that must not suppress people must not suppress people and this is also to say that it should be uh, aimed at uh, making the best or getting the best for the people getting the best for the people that is the opposite of suppressing it must not suppress people it should aim at bringing out the potential and the best in the people the other one is that it must be open and clear it must be open and clear uh, by clarity we mean uh, just a minute it must be open and clear and uh, what we mean by this is that uh, it should be easy to read get meaning, understand without a lot of complexities and uh, generally the meaning should come out very clearly. So it should not be something that is ambiguous that uh, you know we can get a lot of meaning, meanings from it. So it should be that clear and then it should also be compatible with the rules of nat natural justice, should be compatible with the rules of natural justice natural justice yeah natural justice what we generally expect so it should be compatible with those rules of natural justice uh, in the common law and then we also say that it should aim at regulating human conduct regulate human conduct it should aim at regulate hum regulating human conduct that is to control the conduct of people or basically to shape the way they are going to behave. Uh, the other one, equality, of course, this one goes without saying equality. It should uh, aim at, at uh, treating people equal. Uh, and uh, this one also goes with fairness and justice. Fairness and justice. So talk of equality, fairness, and justice. And then, of course, it should be capable of being enforced capable of being enforced otherwise you can come up with a law that cannot be enforced 
that will mean that it may not be a good law because it may not stand the test of time uh then uh, i think these are good enough but we can also add another one that it should uh, uphold uphold the individual rights individual rights and what is considered generally as the community good it should uphold individual right and uphold the community good this is also one of the other characteristics of a good law we can also say there's quite a number of points here so we may not exhaust this was a relatively open question so we can say that um, good law also should be stable stable over time or consistent consistent it should not be a law that keeps on changing changing today this is uh, the, 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 the interpretation tomorrow a totally different uh, interpretation or a totally different set of laws that come to you know there should be some kind of stability and consistency in the law and its interpretation so the then of course uh, the, 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 the uh, good law should also be known to the people known to the people it it you know known to the people that it rules against so if people don't know that the, 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 the existence of the law then it means that that is not good law so good law should be the law that is known to the people who it supposes to govern all these are points that can uh, help you uh, answer this question and see we have more than 10 points so just pick any seven and we'll be good to go let's go to the next question uh, discuss for differences between courts and tribunals now courts where do courts get their powers from courts get their powers from the government the government is me and you court gets the powers from the, gov the government me and you so remember uh, the three arms of government we have the legislature the judiciary and the executive and all these get the powers from the people so courts get the powers from the government and that comes in as one of the key differences between courts and uh, tribunals let's just talk about the courts and then we'll talk about the tribunal so courts get their powers from the uh, government and it's part of the a, a very important part of the judicial system very important part of the judicial system uh, then the ruling of the court rulings of the court will include uh, judgments so courts will make judgments will make decrees courts will also make acquittals acquittals and they will also make conviction so these are some of the end results the rulings that we expect from the court judgments decrees acquittals conviction which may not be the case in the tribunals actually for tribunals we only ex expect awards we expect awards and tribunals get their powers from, not from the government but they get their powers from the statutes they get the powers from the statutes those now that brings out the difference clearly that the courts get the powers from the government the tribunals get the powers from statutes the uh, rulings of the court include judgment decrees acquittal conviction rulings of the tribunals are the awards so we expect awards primarily those are the what you expect from the uh, tribunals then uh, of course there's a lot of independence independence in the court the level of independence in the court might not might not be equal to the level of independence in tribunals in tribunals independence yeah as much as it's there but it's not as standing out or autonomous as what we expect in the in the court so independence here is totally assured totally assured here in the judgment as opposed to the tribunals tribunals independence may not be a hundred percent assured because the people you know it goes back to the system the the the, 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 the people involved in tribunal their tenure 
tenure, their tenure and terms of service are majorly dictated by the executive branch. And you know, from that angle, then it means they may not be as independent as we wish them to be, as opposed to the the courts, you know, who are totally independent because they, you know, they give the, the, the judges are employed by the JSC and you know that line. So that totally something that is uh, autonomous to the judiciary system. And so that makes them uh, quite uh, independent compared to the tribunals, which have some uh, influence from the executive. Then uh, the courts adhere strictly to the established rules of procedure and evidence. They adhere strictly to the established rules of procedures and evidence and that may not be the case in uh, the tribunals they don't adhere strictly to those established procedures and evidence instead they are based on they operate basically based on the rules of natural justice they operate based on the rules of natural uh, justice uh, and not necessarily to the civil procedure so theirs is uh, majorly dictated by the rules of natural justice, while these ones adhere strictly to the established rules of procedure and evidence. And maybe we can also say that these ones may not be so much strict on the evidence. They might also uh, want to rely on the hearsay. hearsay. That information is, can be important to the tribunals as opposed to the courts. In the courts, they rely so much on the evidence, but in the tribunals, uh, they might also want to work with uh, the hearsays, and uh, sometimes uh, they work also with unsworn testimonies, and that tells you something about the tribunals. The scope. Courts will always handle uh, a wide variety of cases, wide variety of cases, while the tribunals only handle some specific uh, cases, not a wide variety. So for them, they only uh, handle some specific types of cases and not as wide, uh, and they don't enjoy a wider scope as in the court's case. Yeah. Now, what else can we say? Uh, the decision of the tribunals is not final. Decision of tribunals, not final, and is subject to acceptance by the people who gave it the powers. While for the courts, the decision is final. I think that is the other difference that is also worth uh, noting here. So I think we can work with those. Those are around six differences. Around six differences. So. Pick any four and will be good to go. Pick any four and will be good to go. Perfect. That is the end of that question. Let's meet in question.